This is a CTV News special presentation. All I knew was he was the monster of my childhood years. A brutal dictator. Idi Amin killed roughly 500,000 people. Sparks a desperate exodus. They were literally ripped apart from their home. And an emotional homecoming. Nothing looks familiar. <laughs> Decades in the making. 55 years. Sometimes life doesn't really work out the way you want it to. Growing up, my parents always spoke so fondly of this land far away, Uganda. I think I always saw it in my mind's eye as such an ideal place. They were literally ripped apart from their home. They were born in that country. My grandparents were born in that country. And because of some awful twist of fate, they had 90 days in which to leave. It doesn't make sense that a person would have a dream overnight, and the next day, he would just decide to expel all the Asians. Bye-bye. Oh, Thank, nice Thank you very so much. Thank you. Thank you. I honestly don't know uh, what to expect. I haven't been there for 50 years. I'm getting mixed feelings. I, I don't know what will happen. I want to go back because I want to understand my mom better. As children, uh, we think we know our parents, but when we see where they grew up, how they grew up, that's when we really understand and I think truly appreciate them. What are your first impressions? Well, Omar, nothing looks familiar. <laughs> Everything has changed. I mean, I, you know, I just don't recognize anything up here. First and foremost, I want every Canadian to know this story because it is a story of determination, of strength, of resilience, and it is a story of how immigration and immigrants add to the richness of this country. After telling other people's stories for 15 years, I want to be able to have some part in telling my own. And an important part of that is to be able to go to my mom's homeland and experience her return for the first time in 50 years. We had a sense that with a mean, you were dealing with a highly unpredictable and very, very volatile man. You just had to read all his titles, Conqueror of the World's Beasts, and on and on and on. And so there was a really good sense that things could get very, very bad very, very quickly. Uganda's Idi Amin grabbed global attention in 1971 at just 46. He staged a coup to oust former ally and president Milton Obote. Amin, a military commander, became one of the most brutal and murderous dictators of the modern era. A master of the media who tortured his opposers. They were blindfolded, then thrown in the backs of trucks, driven around Kampala city for several hours, so they wouldn't know where they were being taken. But finally, they would end up in this dungeon right here. When he got them, he would bring them here, electrocute them, and then stab them to death, and some were killed instantly. He was pretending at times to be a good man in camera, but the reality, he wasn't a good man in our country. Idi Amin killed roughly 500,000 people, that's half a million, and that was roughly 5% of the population of Uganda. 
in the 1970s. A lot of people had died. They were brutally murdered or massacred, or whatever, burnt alive. So a lot of gruesome things had happened. All I knew was he was the monster of my childhood years. Idi Amin accused Ugandan Asians of sabotaging the economy. He wanted them out of the country. And on August 4th, 1972, he announced they had just 90 days to leave. I want to see that the whole Kampala street is not full of Indians. It must be proper black and uh, administration in those shops is run by the Uganda. What will happen to these people if they don't go? I think they will be sitting like they are sitting on the fire. I will tell you this. I think they will not sit comfortable here in Uganda. I will tell you this. I must actually tell you the truth. Do I think that expelling or kicking out an entire community is ever justified? No. Do I think that I can be a part of trying to get a better understanding of that from the other side? Yes. Indians came to Africa in search of a better life, many making a perilous journey in boats called dhows across the Indian Ocean, some answering the British colonial call for labor to help build a massive railway. Construction began in the Kenyan port town of Mombasa, and the rail line would stretch to the eastern shore of Lake Victoria. After it was built, more than 6,000 workers continued to migrate and settled in Uganda. When people made that initial journey from the Indian subcontinent to East Africa, it was quite perilous. Shazan Mohammadi is a historian and author who now helps to define Canada's immigration policies. His mother was just 19 when she arrived in Canada after being expelled from Uganda. His research examines the class system developed by the British. Basically what was established once you got to Uganda was a three-tiered race and class hierarchy. Basically, a sandwich, where at the top you have the white colonialists, then you had what was known as these middlemen, your South Asian community. So they had established themselves as merchants, as traders, as public servants. And so what ends up happening is you have black Ugandans on the bottom layer of this sandwich. They're the ones working for the Asian middlemen. Referred to as Asians, this group was almost entirely from India. They represented just 1% of Uganda's population in the 1970s, yet they controlled the majority of business. And I took this decision for the economy of Uganda. He had accused the Asian community of economic sabotage, of a failure to integrate socially. And the reality was he rose under this populist movement. He rose under the idea and figure of being a man of the people, if you will. Idi Amin camouflaged the expulsion as an economic decision. But many countries didn't buy it and went to the UN. There were many attempts at the United Nations to try and get Amin to repeal the decision. None of them were successful. And so by August 24th, Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau makes the announcement that we're going to be sending a team of Canadian immigration officials to Kampala to start this process. We assumed that they were all going to have to go. We could see it happening on the streets around us. We were almost living like a prison. We were not allowed to go out. And at night time, you could hear the machine guns and the noise was so loud. To be really honest, I was quite scared. And so was my family. We didn't know what to think about it, except that we knew that the president will probably not change his mind. And then we had to pack everything and leave. We didn't have any doubts in our mind that if we didn't get as many as we could out of the country, the people who left behind were going to be in serious danger. 
everything we feared about Kampala and what was going to happen in Uganda had happened. And Idi Amin had ordered on the 4th of August that the Asian community had to leave. I want to see that the whole Kampala street is not full of Indians. You just wait after three months. What will you do to them? Okay, you will <laughs> see. This is my ancestry. My roots in Uganda began in the 1800s. Years later, my parents and grandparents were among thousands of Indian families forced to leave. Canada became one of the countries providing a safe haven. We certainly felt that these people had a damn good reason to get out of there. For us, the question was, of these large number of people, who should we be taking? Canada's Michael Malloy was just 28 years old and a young visa officer in Beirut when he was dispatched to Kampala, days after Idi Amin's decree. There was discomfort in some parts of Canada about why would we open the doors like this? Uh, there was an election happening at the time. And I think Trudeau saw it as a kind of a teaching moment. But I think the general principle of Canada helping people in need and distress uh, is accepted by all Canadians. When the Prime Minister of Canada, Pierre Trudeau. Made his, Pierre Trudeau, made his announcement, he said, for our part, we are prepared to offer an honorable place in Canadian life to those Ugandan Asians who come to Canada under this program. That line, an honorable place in Canadian society, told us the attitude our Prime Minister expected us to exhibit when we were dealing with these people. And so they were going to be treated with kindness and courtesy and consideration and compassion. Canada and Britain set up makeshift visa offices in downtown Kampala. The first day they opened, there were lines that stretched for blocks. We couldn't see the end of the line. Uh, and something like uh, 5,000 people showed up that day to get applications. So that's my first image was, holy smokes, <laughs> what, what, what's that's coming at us? Michael Malloy helped those who no longer had any citizenship. Numbers were used instead of names to track families so that they wouldn't be targeted by Ugandan authorities. These numbers would then get posted in the local English paper for callbacks. Those numbers became the most important piece of information available to anybody in Uganda, and they guarded people's security. People were being threatened, people were being robbed. We were already hearing stories about people being told by military police officers, I'm taking your house when you go, I want your car when you go. There were attempts to shake these people down. The numbers represented freedom, they rep represented hope. Yeah, they hope for sure that the Canadians have my application and if, if the number comes up, we won the lottery. This journey to Uganda has brought back a lot of memories from my mom. It's been 50 years since she's seen these roads. She was a student when the expulsion happened. The atmosphere seemed very solemn at that time. Everything seemed so eerie. You could, you could feel the atmosphere. Today, my mom is coming to see an old classmate. How are you? Oh my God. <laughs> 55 years. Oh it's God. a long time, long time. Nice to see you. Same here. My sister Nephilia and I have come along to meet her. Hi. Hi how are you? I'm good. Thank you for having us. Oh, you're welcome. Shamim returned to Uganda nearly 30 years ago. Everybody thinks, oh, coming to Uganda is so scary, but it really is not. It isn't? It isn't, no. It's not like what it used to be, you know? That's and how, that's the I picture I had in my yeah. mind when I first came up here. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's a totally different picture now. The pictures trigger lighter moments. Of course, oh, that's, you can't even remember how old was I, but I think that's how you would remember me. Yeah, that's how I remember you. Well, I actually, one time, I was sitting next to um, somebody in the class, but then we were talking too much, so the teacher decided to change our seats. And it was us. <laughs> was it us? Yes. Do you remember? 
Shamim is just one of many Asians who has returned to live and work in Uganda. There is also a new wave of Indian immigrants calling Uganda home. Jinja is a bustling economic hub and a city that has drawn many Indians back. Do you think it's different now than it was in 1972? Yes, clearly. How? Uh, because like people have understood. Uh, education has played a major part into it. The people who understood that, you know, we have to work between the community and like this is dynamic culture. If we work together, the progress is going to be there. So there's been a shift? Yeah, it has been, it has been. My dad never had a chance to return to Uganda. We lost him in 2015. I often wonder what he would say about this trip. It's a trip that we had talked about. And sometimes life doesn't really work out the way you want it to. I know he'll be with us and I know he's here. I know he's here. He always told me the story about how he wanted to stay in Uganda until the very last day. And he told me the story about how he was at home and Ugandan military came to the home and basically told him to get into the car. He had no idea where he was going. He didn't know what was gonna to happen to him. And he ended up taking them to a local watering hole, a local bar. Eventually, these men were so drunk, they were so inebriated, they forgot that they had actually captured my dad. And the server who was actually at that bar basically nodded to him and said, don't worry, I'll take care of these military guys, you go. And that's how he was able to escape. My dad made it to Canada on the very last flight chartered in November of 1972. He started his new life in Vancouver immediately after. I want to go back because I just want to see you know, where he grew up and where he lived and where my mom grew up and where she lived. And again, I want to go because I want to understand them better. So it says 21, wait. 23, 25. 23, 25, we must be close. Yeah. That's it. 20, oh, here, here it is, here it is. That's it, he used to yeah. live there? But is, well, is that? Because he was saying the, the store was at the bottom. Yeah. And they used to stay at the top. Wow. I think that he used to talk about this place as a very idyllic place, one where he wouldn't want to leave. And I know you had said when we were down there, you could see why. Yeah, I said I could see why he never wanted to leave because it was just such a community feel. It was relaxing. It was the balcony. I could just, I could totally see why he wouldn't have wanted to leave that area. I felt him. I felt him with me when I was up there. for my family to be there, for my feet to be touching the soil where they were born. It's something that I had longed to do. But I also realized in that moment that life in some ways was such a lottery. And in fact, I remember my father saying that what happened to us 50 years ago was really a blessing in disguise because ultimately it brought us all to, to Canada. On the day of the Summit Series hockey games in Moscow, there was a lunch going on where the Aga Khan, leader of the Ismaili community in Uganda, was meeting with a Canadian official to find out how many refugees the Canadians would be bringing to this country. Now, Cabinet had instructed that there be no official number because the idea was to have as many people come as we could process. Uh, you have a figure in mind. Uh, we have budgeted for uh, financial reasons for a certain number, but we're not mentioning any figure. Right? The 3,000 high for which is the budget? Well, I say it's pure speculation, and I don't want to involve myself in it. But at one point in the game, the Aga Khan said to his host, 
well, how many people are you going to accept? And at that very moment, someone from the staff of the guest house signaled to the Canadians that the score was three to three. And so the head of the Canadian delegation at the lunch put six fingers on the table. The Aga Khan saw that and said, 6,000, well, that would be splendid. As many as 80,000 had been expelled in all. And indeed, more than 6,000 of those came to Canada. This was the first flight that landed in Montreal. A ticket to safety after the torment of leaving all that was familiar behind. There would be 30 more flights just like this in less than two months. The families were greeted at CFB Long Point in Quebec with hope in a new home after being forced out of their last one. We had flip-flops on, like we didn't have shoes on. We, we came off of the airplane and there was snow on the ground. It was cold. I remember them wrapping us up with a bunch of coats, big bulky coats with fur around the hood. Pratiba Popit was the youngest of five children in the Popit family who came to Canada on one of those flights. But when we arrived in Montreal, they spoke to dad and my brother and mom and said that Nova Scotia has a new Michelin plant and it's a great opportunity. There's lots of jobs. It's a small rural community, a town of, I think, four to 5,000 at the time. The Pulpits made headlines in Bridgewater. They joined the local Lions Club and a weekly bowling league. Mom still talks fondly about bowling. She goes, do you remember when your dad and I used to go bowling? And yeah, they loved it. Mom said, it's important wherever you are, to be yourself, but to also embrace the culture you're in. And when Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau came to Bridgewater, they weaved through the crowd. So mom put on her beautiful sari and dad put on his tie and his suit, and they were determined to meet him and they shook his hand and dad thanked him. Food became synonymous with the Popit family name in Nova Scotia. They cooked for neighbors. One brother wrote cookbooks. Another opened a restaurant. Pratiba's father opened a unique grocery store. He opened up an Indian store in Halifax, Pulpit's Grocery. It was the largest East Indian store east of Montreal. So we had the groceries and the spices and stuff. And also, Mom started making sweets, so burfi and gulab jamun and ladu. <laughs> I've come back to where that store was. Decades later, it's a home. Come in. Then we come. Yeah, come on in. And the owner couldn't be more welcoming. Well, I know that you have deep memories here, and I, the community has deep connections to remembering you here. I love to show it to you. Come inside. How are you? Oh, yeah, for the grocery director. What does it feel like to be back inside? Oh, it's amazing. Like, it's I've, emotional. Yeah, it's emotional. I've, yeah, lots of memories here. Popit's grocery was dad's dream. And, you know, we're really glad that we were able to, uh, to open it and to serve such an amazing community. <laughs> Back in Uganda, while the Popit family can't be here with me, I wanted to help them visit their first home, three hours north of the capital in Kamuli. I have numbers, you check. 13? Number? Uh, uh, 15. 15. Uh, 13. 13 by the one. In these villages, finding a marked address is difficult. I think this is it. 13. I have a Popat family, Hati. 1970s, me. Popat family. A Popat family, Dukan Hati. Tulsi Ramji Popat. Tulsi Ramji Popat. Ha. The shop owner recognizes the family name and invites me in. Hey, Jay, how are you? I'm okay, how are you? I'm very good. I I'm happy to see you. I first connect with Jay Popit and his 89-year-old dad, Rajlal. We found your store. Here, I'll show you. I'll show you, Uncle. One second. And in the precious moments that follow, 
we step back in time. Very little has changed here. Hey, Prathima. Good, good. I just got Jay on the other line. We're in your former kitchen. This is where the culinary influencer Bridgewater started. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember mom used to cook in there. I remember mom used to cook in there. Yep. Oh, it actually smells really good. I might stay for dinner. Yeah. Okay. The, the house that, that's on the side, that, that used to be my uncle used to live there. Over here. It's like, you know, every inch and, you know, configuration of the household. That's wild. It wasn't lost on me when we were inside their home in Kamuli. When we were at that kitchen, that is the kitchen that planted the seed for their business in Bridgewater, Nova Scotia. That is the kitchen that basically allowed them to share their food, their culture, their way of life with the Canadian people when they arrived 50 years ago. Amin Bhatia is a world-renowned composer in Toronto who was just 10 when he and his family fled Uganda. His father was a high-ranking Ugandan engineer who felt trapped by Idi Amin's regime. That scene in The Sound of Music where they're quietly pushing the car down the street so that nobody is alerted to them leaving, we did that because the government was starting to be suspicious that our, my parents were trying to get out of the country. Because he worked a government job, he didn't want anybody to know he was leaving. A couple of times he inquired about leaving the country and they said, no, we need you here. We left everything behind. We had to make it look like we were just going on holiday. By this point, the army had taken over the country. Any soldier had power to do anything they wanted. A uh, friend of my parents, she was raped. But these are the kinds of things that started showing up all over the place that, you know, clearly had, had my parents alarmed. This was grade three, not knowing that a year and a half later, this would all be gone. After we left, I mean, it was so shocking because it was literally overnight. All the people we'd come to know, all the school kids I'd come to know, our, our nanny, you know, like overnight, gone, never to be seen and heard from again. Coming to Canada was an adjustment. So on my first day of school, I was the only brown kid in the entire school. They knew I was from Africa, and they had all kinds of stereotypical questions the other way. Like, did you and your family live in a mud hut? Do you know what it's like to eat with a fork and a knife? Did you have a pet tiger when you were growing up? And I was like, well, first of all, there's no tigers in Africa. Please remember that. And uh, no. <laughs> So it, it, was, it was huge culture shock. It took a while to adjust. And bit by bit, year by year, I had a lot of kind people help me and my parents kind of acclimate and learn what it's like to live in Canada. My parents had to rebuild everything from the ground up, like from nothing. Amin took his first piano lessons as a child in Uganda but his dad bought him his first keyboard in Canada. He had no idea how expensive they were. I mean, the first mini Moog synthesizer I got cost $2,000. So, bless my parents' heart, they went into a, you know, they went into their credit card and they got me this mini Moog synthesizer and for weeks I was making these horrific noises in the basement. But then as the weeks went by, I actually started to figure out how to make music with this thing. An award-winning composer, Amin has created scores for popular TV dramas and collaborated with artists like David Foster and Toto. Everything I've ever wanted has, has happened in Canada, and it's been amazing. My dad to his last day, his request to me was, please never go back, not even for a visit. I mean, he'd risked his life to get us out of there. Both he and my mom had, had put their lives on the line. They were simply scared that going back there, what if, what if something happens all over again?
Hey, I'm in. Talk to me. What, what, do you, what have you got? I think I'm at your childhood house. Does this street look familiar behind me? Yes, it does. That's Ridgeway Drive. That is the street that my dad and I would go back and forth for walks every evening. And then do you remember you gave us a photo of you playing on a tree? Yes. OK. Well, there was somebody living close by who was kind enough to show us where that tree is. We think we've got it. Can I show it to you? Yeah. <laughs> I can sense your excitement here. OK, one second. So based on the picture, and I, look, it's been 50 years. Either this one or this one. And it's, we think it's this one. Wow. So what's going through your mind right now? We're, we're, at, we're at the place where you grew up. It's, it's pretty wild. I can see the city in the distance. I remember always being able to enjoy that view from our front garden. I can recognize the shadows and the light of the sun on that street. Like, wow. Yeah, this is amazing. To see the expression and the excitement in his voice was unbelievable. And at the end of the day, really, it was an excitement over a tree. <laughs> and it was a tree that, you know, he played on when he was a kid. But the tree was very symbolic because it connected him to himself, his roots, where he came from, who he became. There were two things I remember growing up that, that were huge in our household. And one was service, giving back, and the other was education. And I know that those are two fundamentals that my parents really wanted to give to my sister and myself. They came to a completely different country with very little. And yes, they worked hard. Yes, they poured a lot of sweat. Yes, there were sleepless nights. Yes, there wasn't a lot of money. But there were a lot of people in this country that made it possible. It definitely was a cultural shock. There is no doubt in that. People looked at you with being a, a different face, and uh, it took me some time to get adjusted to it. It was challenging, but pretty soon I got used to it. And after that, it just became a second home to me. My mom was one of thousands expelled from Uganda by one of the deadliest dictators of the modern era, Idi Amin. When she came to Canada, she lived at the local YWCA and first took a job in the mailroom at the Vancouver General Hospital. She worked her way up to be an executive secretary. In the beginning, it was very difficult. And of course, I couldn't have everything that I wanted to, or even I needed to at the time, but then I had to do the best I could. What this place really offered me is the independence. I wasn't codependent, I was a survivor. Coming to Uganda wasn't just about returning with my mom. I wanted to take in the country and visit cities with new waves of immigrants, I wanted to see if things had changed. Though Idi Amin was a cunning and deadly dictator, he had support when he expelled the Asians in 1972. These students from Makarere University marched in high spirits to the city center to congratulate President Amin on his decision. Today, a new generation is learning here. I've come to McCrary University to see what has resonated. Take me back 50 years ago. From the Ugandan perspective, why was Idi Amin justified in kicking out the Asians? Because they controlled the economy, simple and straight. They failed that justification that Amin had to do what he did, because you cannot claim to be independent when your economy is in the hands of 
another entity. And the Ugandans didn't feel like they were they in charge of their life. They did not feel that they were in charge of their life, especially the economic one. You go in the shop on the streets, you don't see anybody who looks like you, for that matter, in charge of a business. The argument has been made by several people, those who liked him and those who did not like him, saying that what Amin did was okay, but he could have done it in a better way. Idi Amin ruled for eight years. In that time, he was responsible for the brutal killings of hundreds of thousands who opposed him. In 1979, he fled Uganda, first hiding in Libya and then in Saudi Arabia. On his deathbed, he came face to face with the Ugandan Asian he had expelled, a Canadian nurse who was working in the Saudi capital. When I did see him being wheeled in my unit, that's when it sank in that, oh my God, this is the Idi Amin. The little girl in me needed to tell him that my father never forgave you for doing this to us because my father loved Uganda. And, and he held on my hand and said, please help me, please help me. I'm a very sick man. And I said, yes, sir, we will help you. Don't worry. He just looked frightened with, uh, with his big eyes. There was no question in my mind that I would not help him. He was not doing well at all, and uh, I needed to pull at least four liters of fluids from him to stabilize his condition. And uh, that's what we did. in a small town of Nabusanke with a population of about 150 to 200 people. And everyone knew each other and it felt like a family. Sometimes my dreams are that I'm walking in Nabusanke being a smaller town, there were only uh, two streets opposite each other. And I dream myself walking from a one corner to the other corner of the town. Just take a breath and you'll be fine. The impact of this journey is emotional. No, it's a lot. It's, it's, it's a, a lot, lot to go through. Just leaving the hotel, knowing where my mom is about to take us, is a lot. We drive for two hours south of Kampala towards the equator. And when we get close, my mom remembers the only marker was a gas station. Ma, you said you used to turn right to yes. get to your place? Yes, that's right, yeah. Um, a turn right, and um, yeah, the, the other way we could get in was after the equator, we would also turn right. But this sounds like the right place, though. We've come all this way, we're gonna find it. Okay. We're gonna find it. All right. <laughs> the children here are drawn to us, especially my sister Nephilia. <laughs> Our cameras bring attention too. The kids love seeing their reflection on our screens. The energy is infectious. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. We continue and take one of the dirt roads in. Was it a one-story house? Um, yeah, it was just a one-story. There are few clues here 50 years later. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm on a treasure hunt. We find someone who might help. I was born here, in Nabusanke, but I don't know where my house is. There's a school, and then there's a, a prayer hall. Uh, in the middle, 
There is a well where people fill the buckets with water. There is one borehole there. Yeah, I've seen a borehole. There, there's a borehole there. Then there was a Jamat Khan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The site of a former prayer hall and a well brings some hope. If the bakery was here, then, the, then, then my house would be at the end of the bakery. Yeah. Can't believe this. It's a long time, 50 years. Mm -hmm. The searching is overwhelming. Let me get to the bakery first. <laughs> we stop to rest and accept that my ma's home is no longer here. You realize on a rational level that 50 years is a long time, but to see it and to realize that the place you were born doesn't exist, the place where you used to pray doesn't exist anymore. It's got to be destabilizing to a certain degree. And I think she's still coming to, to terms with that. I just feel totally blessed that I have been given this opportunity to visit Uganda one more time. And I will be able to leave on my own terms this time, rather than having been forced or having been expelled. Ultimately, immigrants who come to Canada just want to be given a shot. And I think what my family's story shows, and what so many other Canadian stories show, is that if they're given that opportunity, it's something that's transformative. It was important for me always to be able to step foot on that soil with her at some point during her lifetime. And we did that.